Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I had a, uh, my speech not, sounds funny, I had a tooth extracted yesterday, so I apologize. <laughs> I'm trying to get, uh, but I'm so privileged and honored to be here, and, and uh, one of the proudest titles I have is, um, I, I like to think of myself as Dean Carroll's uh, nephew, <laughs> and the Carrolls are a, a dear uh, family to me, and, and I'm so honored to be here and to see all the incredible job, Dean Carroll, you have done for uh, the entire St. Paul's uh, church and the community. And a big round of applause for the Dean, please. <laughs> so today, it's gonna to be more of a, a Q&A. Uh, I'm so honored to be here today. Today, uh, this is my 93rd church I've spoken at in the last uh, uh, six months. We've traveled around 19 different states uh, going uh, to preach the good word and, and do what we can to end the Christian genocide in Iraq. Uh, I myself am an American born, uh, but my, my parents immigrated from Iraq in 1979. Uh, fear of persecution because you can't uh, openly be a Christian in Iraq. And right now, uh, the reports we're getting and, and what we're seeing, it is a full blown uh, genocide. And um, to think about what they did last year, uh, they've killed around 13,000 people. Uh, 25,000 were kill, uh, injured. Uh, every single day, more and more lives are getting lost because of their refusing to convert. And ISIL is getting more and more powerful by the day. They're making around $4 million selling oil on the black market. It's, it's, dangerous now as it was seven months ago. I know a lot of news outlets aren't talking about it uh, as much as they could or should, but it's a nightmare. And we've been able to save a lot of lives in the last six months, but not as many as we would like. In, in the very beginning, last June, uh, when reports weren't coming out, we were getting phone calls from Iraq about beheadings and slaughterings and displacements. We reached out to local media, and, and the only one that was responsive, it's really a lifesaver, is John Carroll. Thank you, uh, Brother John, for everything he's done. And, and uh, through his journalism, we've been able to save a lot of lives. But right now, we're at a critical point in this movement. This is the equivalent to uh, the Holocaust for the Jewish community. In, you know, in the earlier, in the 19th, 20th century. And a, an incredible community has been the Jewish community. They've stepped up and they've called us and, and they've joined us. Rabbis have gone with me to the White House and to Washington, D.C. and to the State Department. And they've said themselves, you know, we know what it's like to be exterminated of your faith. And right now, Christians your people, my people, our people, being exterminated, being slaughtered, being beheaded because we refuse to convert our religion. And, and the sad thing about the Iraqi Christians and in Syria is 50% of the victims, 50%, are children 12 years and younger. I got a call uh, a month ago uh, one mom, her name was Samira, she said they, they beheaded her, her daughter right before her eyes. And so I've made this a life mission of mine. I'm, I'm a volunteer and I've traveled around everywhere I could go and I, and I like to speak to as many groups as possible, as many churches, as many congregations, as many, uh, you name it. Two people will listen and one person and we're here to talk because we have to do something. We have to stop this. We have to save their lives. We can't fix Iraq or Syria. But what we could do is we could save the people that want to leave. We've compiled a list of 70,000 people that are begging to be rescued. We've identified 70,000 sponsors. So if they come over, then they won't take any social services. We just need to get them. And so I, I ask today for your prayer for your support, for your love, and for your voice. Because every single one of you here today could make 
a huge impact to saving someone's life. And not rhetoric, reality. If every one of you today call the local news stations, talk to the news director and say, how come we're not talking about ISIL killing Christians? How come we're not talking about Christians being beheaded because they refuse to convert? How come we're not talking about this innocent family? I give you thousands of names of families that are begging just to live. They don't want no special treatment, no special favors, nothing for free. They just want to be able to practice their religion, wake up every morning in a safe place and not have the fear of a beheading because of who they believe in and what they believe in. And I think us as Christians, we are called to do God's work, not our work. We, give, we have a limited space of time on this earth, whether it be one day or 100 years or 50 years or 22 years. And he tells us, you know, spread the good word and help folks who, who can't help themselves. And I can promise you, the people in Iraq and Syria right now are begging and pleading with the world, please, please, please rescue me. Please save me. We have around 400,000 of them have, that have been displaced. They're in different camps. And now we're trying to figure out a way to get them out of Iraq and to other neighboring countries and to a safe zone. But short term, they've been living like that for eight months. 200,000 of them are children, 10 years or younger. And so although we've had a lot of success getting humanitarian aid and airstrikes through the President, through the United Nations, right now we need more exposure on this issue. We need folks to talk about this cancer in our society, which is people killing Christians. Because if we don't talk about it, we can't fix it. If we can't fix it, it won't stop by itself. Without a doubt, people that are killing other people for religion, it's the devil's work. We cannot let the devil's work happen on earth. And I call on every single one of you to join us, to help us, to pray for us. We have a brochure we, we handed out. We have a website to please join our movement of everything we've accomplished. I just came back from Washington, D.C. We have another bill this year we're going to uh, propose. But I can tell you, Washington is broken as it's ever been. <laughs> For the next two years, they're going to fight and yell and scream and blame each other and not fix anything. <clears throat> so it's the American people, it's, it's, it's us, it's you, it's me, that we need to demand change and really implement it for the betterment, not ourselves, but for humanity. And this is a trying time, I think, for all of us to say, in the face of a genocide, in the face of a Christian holocaust, where people were being beheaded, slaughtered, raped, persecuted because of their religion, what did we do as Christians? I can tell you, if, if, if my parents didn't come over to this best country in the world that we call America in 1979, I would be in the desert. I would be slaughtered because I would not convert. I'm not going to give up my religion to anyone. And so we have to think without boundaries because we're all one people throughout the world. If we were not in America, if we were in that region, we would too be targeted, be persecuted. And we would hope that someone across the world would listen to us and help us. And we have that chance to be the knight in shining armor. And it's not one person, it's all of us. So I ask everyone today to tell five people, to tell ten people, and tell those ten people to tell another ten people. And with this grassroots movement, we will not stop until we save as many lives as possible. And at a minimum, the people who want to leave, let them leave. Let's give them a new home. Let's rescue them.
and everything else that's too complicated, let God take care of that. But for now, let's save the lives that want to be saved. With that, uh, we'll do more conversation, so we'll take questions, and I'm very respectful of your time, and I thank you for the opportunity of being here, but I really want to I really want to engage with the, the thoughts and questions you guys have as opposed to just a, uh, a speech. Yeah. Mark, would you provide us with some perspective on the Chaldean Church? It's my understanding that it was one of the first, if not the first churches in all of Christendom. Yeah. So the the question was for the Chaldean Church. The, the the Iraqi Christians are dated as the oldest Christians in the world. So uh, Christianity, that's more of this uh, cradle of civilization where right now it's under attack. Uh, hundreds of years ago, the majority were Christians, but throughout the years of uh, convert or die campaigns now, uh, less than 1% are Christian. Um, two months ago, they bombed one of our churches that was built 16 hundred years ago. So to put that in perspective, St. Paul's was built 1869. I believe 1869. And, and so this church that they bombed and destroyed was built 1600 years ago. And so they bombed 60 of our churches. They've, they've lost thousands of lives and families. They've marked all the Christian homes with the letter N. stands for Nazarene that now is known as the death stamp, because if they return to their homes, it will, it will explode. Uh, and right now, Chaldeans are, uh, they're in communion with Rome, so it's part of the Catholic Church. But it, this really transcends uh, religion. It's really about humanity. No one should be killed for who they believe in or what they believe in. And it's happening right now. Yeah. Oh, um. What should I go home and, and do today? Um. We will we <coughs> sign up, uh, give us your email, uh, go to our website and sign up so we have your contact information. The, be the biggest thing right now everyone could do, and I really mean this from the bottom of my heart, is pray for us. With also prayer, I would also ask to, to actually contact all the news local news agencies and say there's a Christian genocide in Iraq with ISIS and Chaldeans, why aren't we talking about this more? Because it goes a long way when they hear from someone that's not a national spokesman for ending genocide in Iraq. It shows that, that this is something that San Diegans care about, that people care about. So every day I would either talk, call one station and then we'll give you a list of different members of Congress to talk to and <coughs> Definitely speak to your local congressman and local representative to do something because the government's completely broken. These politicians care about themselves more than anything else, and it's really disgusting. When you say local, you mean like San Diego? Out, members? out to everyone San Diego, your congressman, your councilman, your, your, anyone that represents you. Okay. But I also I would call the media because the power of the media is so tremendous that if we start talking about this like we were six months ago, we could have that rally that we need. Yeah. So, without going into too much of my resume, I, my background has been in community and movement building. And one of the things that brought me to um, the church here mm -hmm. is that my political work on Prop 8 and then later the nonprofits that I built, St. Paul's partnered with us in getting a lot of traction through the media. And I, I, this, this issue, uh, from a strategic messaging perspective, as somebody who's built movements and moved public opinion mm -hmm. has a lot of, uh, pardon the, the inappropriate word, but sure. sex appeal to the way you can sell it. I mean, when I worked for Save the Children, you know, you can really hone in on the concept of exactly tangibly what's happening mm -hmm. and extract a, a real value, be it monetary or grassroots. We worked locally, so I built a company called Canvas for a Cause, which was a local nonprofit here that helped to move public opinion on um, gay marriage. And um, we were responsible for some projects, including locally stopping a ban on um, medical cannabis, and we partnered with St. Paul's on that, and getting ourselves in front of the press. And so, I wonder if you considered using canvassing as a tool um, to move public opinion, because this is the kind of issue that you can get people to stop in their tracks on. And there are national organizations like GCI that 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 will partner with you to get your message out and represent you. And what you really need is to change the hearts and minds. And when you 
speak to somebody in a mall and say, help stop the murder of Christians, I mean, that stops them in the tracks. And it's so, so um, jarring that I think you can get a lot of traction in exactly what you need to do, which is getting your eyeballs in front of the cameras through press conferences. So I'm just curious if you've employed those tactics and what your organizational strategy is in getting sure. in front of the press, because I know how challenging that can be, right, right, right. especially when we're working on cannabis, nobody wants to talk about that. Sure, so sure. how do you get it in the paper and, and get our eyeballs? And, right, right. You know, we did well, that, so. well, we need your help. <laughs> so we need your help. <laughs> so we, need, we need your help, and uh, we have a great communications director at London. But you know, we're all volunteers, and we, we need every idea that you have, and, and uh, any any uh, strategy we could employ or canvassing and grassroots. So, by all means, you know, this is a a uh, we we need everyone's help, and you all you all you, your unique ways, and definitely let's exchange information because we definitely need your help. Yeah? You said that people are being killed when they refuse to convert. Yeah. If somebody is given the choice to convert and they do, mm -hmm. are they actually left alone, or is no. that only, it's, it's only good an question. excuse? So if, good question. Mm -hmm. The question is, if somebody actually converts, what happens? They are, uh, they, they take the woman and make them sex slaves, mm -hmm. and then uh, the men, they make them second class citizens. So there really is not a convertor. Because when they convert, they still see them as infidel. So it really is more of a, a racist kind of a thing. There are certain classes yeah. of people that are all forever stamped with that yeah. category. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, with the 70,000 that are identified, yeah. what's the process uh, currently? Is there um, stalled? Is there Good is question. There people you're identifying on this side? So we were, we, for, with everything we did last year, we were able to secure 33,000 visas for America. The big issue now is the State Department has removed all of our personnel from Iraq. We only have soldiers there now. So without processing the visas, we have the actual visa, but they can't come over here because no one's there to process the visa. So it's been stalled. So we ran all these hoops, we got the visas, and they said, well, no one could process them because no civilians are left in Iraq or Syria. And, and, and I have a good feeling that the next president, whoever it may be, is going to have to deal with this issue. So right now we're looking at um, <coughs> conventional and unconventional ways to get people out of Iraq. Uh, and we're talking to neighboring countries, we're talking to uh, Mexico, we're talking to uh, Iran. Iran might. He said, if you go to Iran, to the Mexican consulate, you go to Mexico and as a Christian. But uh, the U.S. government's completely broken. And I know people say it, I know it's on the news, but it's really, really, really dysfunctional and broken, and everybody should be fired. I mean, everybody should be thrown out and start new, because anyone could do better. <laughs> and, and anyone could do that. You could just say, two people, just work together. That's it. Work together. That's why you just work. Yeah. Um, what is Sorry. it? Oh, I see. You know, it's a, a little bit off the topic, but sure. would you please follow up on that? You've been to Washington. You've talked to these people. Yeah. You've seen it. What, in your opinion, makes it so broken that you can't rely on the federal government? That's a, I mean, that's a, you, you could do <laughs> talks and talks about how, uh, for six months I was in Washington, D.C., and I was at the U.N., and I was at the, the White House and State Department, and I could tell you firsthand, it is more broken than people could think, and it's multifactorial. There's so many factors of why it's broken. I think with the lack of term limits, make it broken. I think people get there and they get entitled and they be, they think they're a little, the congressman will think he's a king or he's a, he's, we're here to serve him as opposed to, they're applying for a job. They're, they're there to serve the people and serve what they think is right and actually work. They're not working. And I think if someone were to do term limits, I think they would clean some stuff up. We've seen in California with, we get, but every time you get new blood in, new changes and you break the, uh, the, the lobbyists and you break the gridlock then, and there's people in Washington that gain from uh, dysfunction and there's a lot of too much money in politics uh, and there's lack of voting and it's just it's a, it's a down world 
spiral and uh, I can tell you it's never been as broken as it is now. I truly think if they throw out everybody and get everyone new, they'll do phenomenally better. You know, and at, at the UN, um, when we went to the United Nations and spoke to, when we spoke to uh, countries, every country told me, we'll give you visas, but we're waiting for America. When America moves, we'll move. Because America, you know, we are still, and I think we'll always be the leader of the world. Because the American people are so, so extraordinary. It's the American people that are so amazing. Pol politicians, though, are terrible. <laughs> terrible. Yeah. What's the perception of the Chaldean Church uh, of the U.S. military during occupation uh, operation Iraq? <clears throat> So in 2003? Right. The, 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 yeah, the, the question was, what was the perception from the Chaldean Church of the 2003 war? Well, I could tell you the numbers. In 2003, we had 1.4 million Christians in Iraq. Today, we have less than 400,000. So we've lost a million Christians. They're out. They've moved. They've been persecuted because of the war, and mainly because when you overthrow a government and you don't secure a border, and the way it was done, the people that are most vulnerable are people without armies and representation, which are the Christians. So we've, we've been targeted and killed and since, <coughs> since 2003, but systematically since, uh, since ISIL. I think you had a question there. Um, right after the Paris mess, yeah. um, photo came across my uh, my Facebook site. And it was kind of a gruesome scene. It was dead bodies in the street. Mm -hmm. um, I don't watch the videos of the beheadings. I just can't handle that. But I do think that we really need to have more photographs so that people can actually see and internalize what's going on. Because sometimes people aren't reading the news or listening to the news. Yeah. Or they just think, oh, that's that group you know, across the ocean somewhere. and that, you know, or even see the destroyed ancient churches. So because I think that kind of makes it more Images. real and then they can understand that, you know, it can easily happen to us. Mm -hmm. um, it could. I mean, well, 9-11. I mean, that's right. a good example. It did happen to us. Yeah. And I, but I think we need more of that to impress Arms. what's going on. That's a good point. We'll definitely incorporate it. And I can tell you that, you know, uh, the head of ISIS is a guy named Baghdadi. Baghdadi was in U.S. custody in 2005. We released him in a prisoner exchange. We released him. And when we released him, he's on quote saying, I'll see you in New York. So he, he, he built uh, this, this army and, and these little factions. And, uh, without a doubt, if we don't stop uh, the slaughter of Christians elsewhere, similar to diseases like Ebola, it will spread over. So it, it, it affects everyone. Well, just speaking of images, uh, there was, uh, as if we need any more um, uh, reason to think of how broken government is, uh, one of my favorite stories of yours is when you were, and I won't mention the name of the congressperson, uh, <laughs> that you were walking by this congressperson's office and saw this congressperson with their legs up and playing video games. Mm -hmm. So a snapshot in time can tell you lots about what's going on. And yeah, I no. thought that was a particular uh, crystalline example. Well said, absolutely right. I think you had a question. Yeah, um, in understanding that the genocide and, and humanitarian issue is incredibly important first and foremost, I'm interested in what the Chaldean um, um, community is doing to differentiate who is doing the, the attacking because in any persecution situation, it could be like, oh, well, then it's the Muslims as opposed right. to the fundamentalist terrorists. Sure. And, and understanding, first and foremost, anyone who is an attacker, right. that, you know, that becomes, you know, sure. your enemy and right. is a life, life threatening. But um, just so it doesn't flip again, just right, like right, in right. terms of a Jewish sure. Holocaust. Yes. Is there is there a conversation going on in in the church about that, especially yep. since there are many different Absolutely. sort of ranges in Christianity between sure. more conservative, more yeah. liberal? I mean, what what is how is that being handled? Just to understand question. that it's 
Who, who the enemy is. Right, right, right. Not and just a, Everywhere we've gone and... and for the people in the back here. Yeah, so the question is with the... The people killing Christians are terrorists. ISIS is not Islam. The vast majority of Muslims are... The vast, vast majority are peaceful, loving, and would never condone any hate, hate or, or crimes or anything. So we've been very, very clear and everywhere we've gone, and in our church as well, to say that uh, no one could kill in the name of religion, period. And whoever does, they're not killing in the name of religion. They're just terrorists. And so ISIS is not Islam. Islam does not preach violence. And uh, this is a chance for, and a lot of Muslim leader, leaders have joined us. You know, the Muslim community, the Jewish community, the atheist community, the Christian community, it's really everyone against the terrorists. But it's, it's so difficult right now because of the dysfunction in Washington. And all the national media folks, it's all about, you know, quick story and you're out. And, and there's media exhaustion. So they'll play a story and they'll play a story, and then the director will say, hey, that's, not, that's enough. We played it too much. But the problem's still going on. It's actually getting worse. And that's where everyone in this room comes in with putting pressure. I mean, if every news station tomorrow gets 100 phone calls to the news director, I had the speaker come into our thing as national spokesman for Iraqi Christian. I understand there's a Christian genocide. Why aren't we talking about this in the news? And if they see that this isn't just a, Chal a Chaldean issue or a Christian issue, it's a, it's a human right issue, that's how we can move, move minds and bodies. Uh, you and your kids. Americans have a great heart. Yes. Just as a people, we have always the, the world's respected us for that. Right. Great heart. We also have a very short attention span. <laughs> <laughs> and what you were just saying about the media, I think that is the focal point because the politicians aren't going to live. That they have their own self-interest. Right. right. Media wants to connect with the people. That's mm -hmm. what their job is. That's yes. what their that's what their uh, their skill is. Mm -hmm. If we could convince them to pay attention, we did for the Yazidis. Remember when they were attacking right. them on the, on the hill? Right. Americans, for a short period of time, paid attention to that. Mm -hmm. Send on our troops, rescue these people. We have mm -hmm. the heart there, but we have to get it on a constant basis that Americans, whether you're religious or not, is a Christian <laughs> country at least in, in its per perception of itself. Yeah. Even an atheist feels, I do the right thing. Right. That's right. a big uh, right. thing for us. If we can convince the media to get out there and expose more about the Christians are under, under persecution, which is connected to us mm -hmm. uh, as a people, and have more uh, of a, uh, <coughs> a fulcrum to change minds and to change actions. Well said, I would definitely uh I think Americans have the, and I really mean this, the best heart. Uh, the American people have the best heart in the world. They just, uh, the media, it's about connecting to them. And, and it's the pressure that everyone in this room could put on the local media stations and the local papers to say, you know, we need to talk about the Christian genocide. People are getting killed. This isn't a Chaldean issue, it's, it's a human right issue. And uh, if we just over, you know, just flood the offices through phone numbers and emails and tweets and Twitters and Facebooks and even the local paper. You know, the, the Union Tribune was phenomenal. They, they did a lot of uh, uh, coverage on it, but even that, we could reignite it. Um, Brother Johns did an incredible job in CW6. And, and But it, it shows a lot when people hear from non, non Chaldeans of how dire the situation and how much you want to know about it. Because this is a, uh, it's a crisis, I think, the biggest crisis we will ever see, uh, hopefully, in our lifetime, a Christian Holocaust. I mean, I remember when I was in middle school, we read about the Jewish Holocaust, and I said, man, if I was in a place of government, I, I would I would have done something to stop it, to save it, save them. And here we are, you know, here I am, you know. 15 years later, 20 years later, it's a Christian Holocaust. And uh, we all need to speak up. Got a question or something? Yeah, 
um, for most of us, the easiest way for us to um, to share a, an issue with our friends is through social media. Mm -hmm. Facebook has been mentioned a couple of times. What's your social media strategy, and is there a page that we should all be looking for on Facebook so that we can we right. can tell our 700 friends or whatever? Sure. <laughs> so. Most of the updates have been coming from my own Facebook, so uh, Marco Rabo, uh, but also there's a communication director, I believe we have a, a End the Genocide is our website, but we need, we need help. So any ideas or movements everyone can help us with, we have the information. We're trying to speak to as many groups as possible. This is today, as I said, the over 90 churches we've spoken to, but we need help activating everyone and, and helping and, and the power of the media is so strong and, and I'm, I'm, we've seen in other markets we had 50 people call every day one station today called 10 today call 9 today call 8 different days call different stations and demand them to cover it and they'll do it if they hear from uh, the people because that's what they want to do I think we have the question we have the question and then we'll go back yeah well Occasionally we hear from some terrorist leader on the news. Mm -hmm. We don't hear from the imam of some mosque in wherever uh, decrying the fact that this is going on. Is that going on? Are there, are there local people preaching against this kind of genocide? Or is it, do they just think, oh, well, that's not our problem? No, I, I think uh, you do have people of all faiths uh, and imams. Uh, an example, when the Paris attacks happened, uh, I believe CARE San Diego, they denounced it and said no one should kill in the name of religion or in the name of free speech. It's happening in the Middle East, though. That's no. what I'm asking. That's no, what no, I'm, no, no. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. The Middle East is more, right now, radicalized than ever. And, and that's why we've been very clear in our support, strong, strong support, for Israel. Israel is one of the only countries in the Middle East that you could openly be a Christian or a Muslim, or a, a Jew, and, and uh, we believe that they're the, you know, the, the canary in the coal mine, because that region is so dark right now. You need lights like Israel. And before Iraq was, but no longer is because of the, the politics and the wars. Uh, Egypt is a place where Christians somewhat could survive. Lebanon is another one. But really, those are the only three countries where you could be openly a Christian and not be, uh, if not chastised or a second-class citizen, uh, killed. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Just um, I, in, a, in addition to his question, is there an increasing percentage of? I know ISIS; they're they're killing Muslims. I mean, yeah. if they're not believing in their particular sect. Right. Right. I mean, is that is that continuing to increase? And I mean, they're just trying to gain traction um, for power. And Right. And do, you, do we know kind of what that looks like currently? ISIL is uh, as emboldened today as they were six months ago. The, the strategy of airstrikes and aid was a, a containment strategy. Uh, you have a disintegration of the Middle East where you have the Shiites in the south, Sunnis and uh, ISIL, some ISIL in the middle, and the Kurds in the north. The Yazidis and Christians are the most vulnerable and are getting slaughtered. But a lot of Muslims have been killed, and a lot of Yazidis from ISIL, if they haven't converted to Sharia law. <coughs> Two groups that do not have any chance to survive are the two that don't have armies and don't have representation, which are Christians and Yazidis. And so the dire need right now is to rescue them out. <coughs> and fixing Iraq, well, it can't be fixed for decades. And it's on the Iraqis to govern the Iraqis, but it's on the generous angels, the America, I believe, America to save people in a genocide. And what is the defining difference between them that they believe that the other Muslims don't? You know, what is the one so ISIL is a terrorist organization. They're not. It's not a group of Muslims that just kill people. They are terrorists. They don't represent Islam. But they have a third of the country. And they've, the, the, the third that they took over strategically was controlled by Christians, mostly, for centuries. The reason why they did that is because the Christians don't have an army, they don't fight back, they just want to 
survive. And they say, okay. All the Christians get out. They knock on your door at midnight. <coughs> out of the house. Every one of you. Who's going to convert? Uh, they're waking up. What do you mean? Who's going to convert? <coughs> okay, all you guys walk. And they kick them out of their house right there. Leave all your belongings. Then they mark their, their house with the letter N. Stand for Nazarene, which is basically Christian. And their home is now property of ISIL. And then a lot of them were slaughtered. A lot of them were, were get the chance to walk. And they have to walk 30, 40, 50 miles to the next city and hoping ISIL won't take over. Yeah. I have a short question to follow up on an earlier topic and then a different question. The okay. shorter question is, you mentioned that uh, Christians are free to worship in Israel. Yeah. Uh, are they free to worship in Palestine? Yeah. Not Hamas. Mm-hmm. Hamas doesn't like Christians. Well, I, I mean... I, I don't want to get into a philosophical. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's just a yes or no because you talked about Israel being the real. But what about Palestine? Are well, I, yeah, and the entire region, yeah. that entire country, Christians are freely uh, okay. are freely to worship. Then my second question is, uh, and forgive me if this was addressed early in the no, <clears throat> program as I was unable to arrive uh, in the very beginning. No problem. Uh, my question is. Can you speak to this dilemma, enormous dilemma, that is leave the Christians in place and right. and reinforce an existing or bring in an outside security force right. <coughs> to protect them, to preserve this ancient right. religion and these ancient <coughs> cultures sure. versus get them out mm-hmm. uh, and and wipe out centuries of the presence of ethnic Christians and other minorities in that region. Great we question. Position and, yes. and why? Okay. You know, I'm a big fan of history, and history repeats itself. And I remember in, in the Holocaust, there was a lot of rabbis that told the Jewish community, don't leave Germany. If you leave Germany, you lose your roots. Those that didn't leave Germany end up being killed and are in a museum. <laughs> Ideally, obviously, everyone would return back to Iraq that's Christian and be, be a kumbaya and they live there. But right now, if, you do, if they were not to be rescued, or they, and they're asking to leave. We're not saying to leave. They're asking to leave. If people would ignore their request of letting them, allowing them to do their free will, not ours, they'd either be killed or converted. Because there's no protection. There's no soldiers. There's no armies. Uh, The American government has been very clear. We're not sending in more soldiers. There's not going to be another troop. Uh, It won't be a surge of troops like it was before. And even if we were to send in thousands of troops, which we're against, uh, and we leave, it's going to happen again. Because the, the, the basis of the government, the way it's formed, is not an inclusive one. Ideally, if it's an inclusive government for Christians, Kurds, Sunnis, and Shiites, it would be perfect. But until that happens, uh, you know, if, if a family calls and says, please rescue me, please, I, I don't want to die, I, I don't think it's anyone's position to say you have to be a martyr. You can't force martyr, <laughs> martyrdom on anyone. Um, uh, I support a lot of environmental organizations on email, and usually they have something prepared if when there's action needed to be taken. Mm -hmm. They have something prepared, uh, and the representatives that need to be for my district, they know all that. And it's really effective. So if maybe if your organization or website or something could have those prepared and see yeah. if we could just click on and say submit, you know, you put in our Perfect. address and phone number. And it really works. Yeah. No, we'll do it. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely do it. And all this is really good feedback. Uh, London's here and the team is here. We'll definitely get something easy where you can just go on a website, put a number, <coughs> click, and it take hits action. take action and it hits everything. Yeah. Um, then we'll come back over. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, 
I noticed that community orga or organizers are, are, it seems like they're always telling people now to call rather than to write letters or write emails. Is that more effective? I, I would do uh, emails and then phone calls. I do all, all of the above. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it seems to me this is actually an executive branch issue, not Congress. Congress is just dis totally dysfunctional. Right. You already have 33,000 visas. Mm -hmm. And so who are you targeting within the executive branch and INS or the State Department to actually get something done? And how do you go about that? So w every two weeks, uh, at a minimum, we talk to Ben Rhodes. He's the special assistant to President Obama and his se senior advisor. We have the, the president's ear. Uh, airstrikes and aid is something that we were advocating for. We received because of all the lobbying we did in Washington. But there's a, there's a, a line that we're split where he won't, the president won't send in civilians to process the paperwork because he feels it's too dangerous. And uh, which we understand where it's coming from. And, and we're trying to thread the needle to see how do we do a way to we could extract them? How do we get them into Guam? Or do what we're doing with in Cuba, where in Cuba, someone could come to, as long as somebody's sponsored, they could come and live with that family while they process the paperwork. So the processing has to be done there before yeah. they leave the country. So you can't have a processing center right. here. Well, here we're working different them. countries are different. In okay. Iraq, that's how it is. Okay. In Cuba, it, it, it's not you like can that. Still go to Miami Cuba, you can go to Miami and live in Miami. Miami. So if you could have that model, right. you could help. So that's what we're trying to work on right now. Okay. And it's an executive branch, but but you know I'm still very hopeful. Uh, we're still working in Congress. So is Ben Rose the person to contact if we want to say how can we help process well, visas or? We'll uh, probably room on. We'll get you the right contact for the White House. Make sure that everyone floods their offices. Yeah. Two parts. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. If they got the visa, what is their chance of actually getting to an airport and/or getting out of the country? Good question. We've been able to map a strategy of we've been able to rescue uh, a good amount of families. We've we have a safe passage model where they could get into a specific airport and leave without sounding the alarm to the bad guys. So yes, if uh, we're able to receive them on this end, we could get them out safely on that end. And the second part, with John amongst, our, amongst us, um, a list of the best contacts if you could provide that for our local, you know, who are our best local news contacts? And uh, that would be really helpful. So for right now, um, we need to have all that clickable on the website. Right. But for right now, um, if you go on to every particular station's uh, website, just like with most websites, it'll say at the bottom, contact us. And uh, just send them an email to the attention of the news director and say what Mark has been urging you to say. Uh, short and snappy wins the day with them because they're being bombarded with stuff every day. So just, you know, like one paragraph, well said, that'll do it. Uh, Follow-up phone calls make a big difference. Uh, it, when news directors hear from, let's say, I'm just going to pick a number out of the air, uh, 25 or 30 people on a subject, they will think in their head, okay, for each one that's gotten a hold of me, there's probably 2,000 out there who are thinking the same thing. So that's very impactful to them if they have that. And not just television. Uh, the UT, uh, there are other good independent publications in San Diego. Uh, one of them smart enough to recognize my brother, uh, the voice of San Diego. Um, so just reach out to all those that you can think of uh, and hit them. I know it's tedious and laborious at this point, which is why we're going to make that not tedious and laborious. Uh, but uh, for now, if you can just do that, um, and then within a week or two, go back to the website, which is listed on the flyer, right? Okay. Go back to the website and check it out and, and uh, see, I'm, I'm putting the pressure on it right now. Uh, <laughs> I get that in there. That's the thing. Yeah. What about Al Jazeera News? Al Jazeera? That's a good one. Right. Uh, in, in the heat of. 
last August we were doing interviews in Al Jazeera. People know the problem in the Middle East. <laughs> the problem is there is no safe haven for Christians, and they're very apathetic. If anyone will save the people, it's, it's America. I think it was later, yeah. yeah there's uh, a word called money. I right. know it's a very naive question to ask you, but does money help the organization? If so, uh, how would we send some? I know it's just one thing, but... Right. <coughs> no, it, it definitely does. We, uh, I'll give you an example. We did a fundraiser last September. We raised $600,000 one night, and we sent it to the camps to buy blankets, clothes, food for the, the children and for the families in Iraq. So, so everything helps, whether it's $5 or $10. It also helps us bring on people that, see this is all volunteer, right? I'm a volunteer, and, and London is a volunteer. It's great to have volunteers, we love to have an army of them, but sometimes to get, to buy ad space, to buy you know commercials, to really take it to the next level, to get the professionals, like you were saying, that we need funds, so mon money definitely so is does it help. on here where we could send? I think if yeah, if you go on the website endthegenocide.com, there's a there's a button we can click on it. Yeah, no, Laurel has. Are you a five one? Is it a five one? It is a five one c three. Okay. So it's a nonprofit. I, I think the website was uh, take, was taken. Yeah. But the, the group is a nonprofit five one c three. It's a nonprofit. Yeah. I think. Laurel has. Laurel, I'm sorry. So I understand everyone and it under, understood the sense of dysfunction in Washington, but I'll never forget um, one of my political science professors talking about how our system is not designed to be led from the top. Like it's just not designed that way. Our politicians are designed to be responsive to us. And if anything, the dysfunction in Washington right now might be because they're hyper attuned to their constituencies, so no one's agreeing on anything. But as Trey said, I think this is one issue where politicians could come together if they actually were hearing from their constituents. So just to kind of reiterate that there is hope mm -hmm. to the extent that we can actually raise our voices. Yeah. Um, because in the, on this particular issue, I don't imagine <coughs> there are great sort of contra interests, but I, I'm wondering about that, honestly. Sure. So the one exception to that, obviously, if, if all constituents in America are actually saying, you will not get a reelected if you don't do something right. about that, then right. their self-interest says, oops, gotta do something about this, and exactly. I'm gonna keep my job. Right. So that's their self-interest is to stay in office, right. and they want to respond to their constituents in order I to agree. do that. But the one exception to that is when there's big power, big money against the constituents' interests, which sometimes can sort of muddy the waters. So in this case, I'm wondering, and I honestly don't know, is there any interest in not acting in this way? Is there any sort of party or like sort of big money to be made in the status quo? I'm just curious, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Is there any person or body that you can think of that really would fight this? Well, I can tell you, so when we meet with uh, this example, so we meet with Speaker Boehner, uh, Speaker in his office, and he says, we have, we have to save the Christians, but the Democrats won't do nothing. I said, well, you have the Congress, just pass something through your Congress. Yeah, but the Senate won't do nothing. And I said, well, just pass it, then I'll go to the Congress. Well, no, then they won't do nothing. <laughs> and so I said, okay, let's do something. We, we, so we introduced a resolution. The first said it will never pass. We, we went out to every single lawmaker, said you have to do this. If you don't, we're going to tell the whole world how you didn't vote on this resolution. Put your foot, feet to the fire. Resolution passes. We go to the Senate. We have to pass something. Did the Congress pass something? Yeah, we're not going to pass it. Why aren't you guys going to pass it? It's a Christian bill because we're not working with them. And literally, one, two offices next to each other. I said, can I take you to the next door? I'll walk you next door. We'll meet together. We'll... No, I'm not talking to them. Then we go to the White House, and they blame Congress. Then I go to the State Department. They blame Congress. And each one, they just point fingers at each other. They're so high. They're, all in, they're always in campaign mode and campaign. And, and, uh, and what I get, and they're also very numb. I think people in, in, in the political office for too long become very, very numb. And they say, well, a lot of bad things happen around the world. And then they, they switch it to something, another reason or another narrative. 
And that's why, with the absence of term limits, you have someone that's a lot of Congress members have been there for 40 years, 30 years, 50 years. They've seen crisis come and crisis go, and they care about getting reelected. So that's why it's getting the masses rallied up. Yeah. Is there um, uh, Chaldean? Chaldean? Not, Chaldean, yeah. Chaldean, okay. Is there a community in the Los Angeles area? There is, but it's pretty small. Okay. It's around uh, uh, 10,000. San Diego is the second largest Chaldean community in the country. We have around uh, 70,000 uh, so Chaldeans. So my, my, my train of thought is um, the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles and Beverly Hills mm -hmm. um, has is an interesting resource in a, a museum for um, pre predominantly the, the Jewish Holocaust, but also features things like Armenia and others. And I think there's so many families and school children that, that run through the Museum of Tolerance, that that might be a way, again, to volunteer-wise or have somebody maybe up there connect with that institution so that it's, it begins to be, oh, and look what's happening at the moment. I think there, it's been ages since I've been in there, but sort of rotate, and this is something as a topic, and that might help, it's a, it's a huge metropolitan area, but that might be a way to get it from like a regional San Diego concern to And so, I just Googled it here, so it's still there. <laughs> but um, it might be a good opportunity for us as Anglicans. Worldwide, there's 80 million of us all over the world. We do the same thing as a church with the Palestinian Christians. They come here, and they talk to our churches, and we give them support and such. Maybe this is an opportunity to do the same thing with, uh, with you all. Thank you. Yeah, we, we definitely need as much. We need as much push as we can get. Yeah. So it's anglicancommunion.org, but it's uh, just Google UN Anglican, and you'll get a phone number you can call. Um, and we have a person that represents us at the UN. Uh, just a second. I, yeah. Someone just made a point here, and, and we need to do this. You keep saying London and stuff, but I know who London is. Oh, I'm sorry. This gentleman right back right, here. Right, right, right. And he's, he's the director of communications uh, for the Neighborhood Marketing Association. When Mark says he's a volunteer, he volunteers his time in the campaign to end the genocide. Right. But that's who London is, and next to him is a fine young man by the name of Armand, who also helps out with all of this. So that's who those guys are back there, just to let you all know. So and I work at Channel 6. You probably don't know who I am. But that's, that's, what, that's what he's doing. He's our brother John. <laughs> so any also recommendations, please flood London as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Earlier, I think you said that uh, Chaldean Church is connected to Rome. Yes. And uh, my question <coughs> is, what are what is Rome doing for the Catholic Church in San Diego? Good question. Mm -hmm. Repeat the question. So the question is that uh, the, the Chaldean church is in communion with Rome, so it's Chaldean Catholic Church. What is Rome and what is the Catholic Church doing? So uh, Chaldean Church became in communion with Rome 500 years ago or so. They, they first were originally, then they split off, now, now they're back. And there's a Chaldean patriarch, which is, a, is an international bishop, which right now is in Kurdistan or, or in Iraq. And so the Vatican and, and the Pope they lean to see what does the patriarch say, even though the highest power is still Pope Francis. And inside the Chaldean Church, there's been the argument that uh, that you were saying earlier of if we let people leave, not if we encourage them, if we let them leave, then we might empty Christianity from the Middle East. So it's a broad, broad, very theoretical, important discussion. And our combat to that is, in reality, if we don't do anything, there won't be Christians in the Middle East because they'll be killed or converted. And so the Chaldean Patriarch has been trying to advocate for protection and for troops 
which no one's sending troops to protect them because Iraq is so broken. It's, it's, it's a house that's in fire. Who would send a firefighter in, in a burning house? And so that's, that's the fine line we've also been trying to walk. And that's why the, the, the Pope, the, the Vatican, hasn't been as uh, enthusiastic in saying let people leave. It just surprises me because the Pope, Pope Francis is so outspoken. Yes. And he doesn't hesitate. Right. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another example. So recently, and I don't, I'm sure a lot of people have seen sound on the news, is the patriarch said to 10 priests locally, you 10 priests that are in America have to go back to Iraq or you're suspended or fired. And so our local bishop, so in the heat of trying to fight ISIL, we get a letter from the patriarch saying, these 10 priests have to leave America. 10 American Chaldean priests that are American citizens leave America back to Iraq or you're excommunicated. And so this bishop, Bishop Jammu, the Chaldean bishop for the Western United States, appealed to Pope Francis, and in a landmark decision, the Vatican suspended the patriarch's decree and said the priest could stay. So there's been a dysfunction in the church hierarchy. Uh, dysfunction in Washington, and there's dysfunction in the church hierarchy. But the, the overall theme is that people are dying and need to be rescued. And, we're, and we keep going, 100 miles an hour. And so if there's any way or any place where we could speak at or let your neighbors know or your folks know or groups, we will go anywhere, any inch of this uh, beautiful country of ours to get our message out. And please keep us in, our, in your prayers. So it sounds like Mark is willing to stay a little bit afterwards if people who don't need to be somewhere have a few other questions or want to discuss things with him. He has graciously offered to do that. But I would invite us to um, say a closing prayer together. It's been a, um, a session I know that's moved many of our hearts and spirits. So I invite us all to pray. The Lord be with you. Gracious God, we pray that you be with those who are threatened, who have faced and experienced extreme horror. May you be gracious to them as they bear their grief and their incredible burdens. We pray too that your spirit would lead us and guide us into the actions that you call us to in our particular time and place with our gifts and our abilities, where we are in this country of ours, teach us and guide us about how we might respond to this word and this witness. Be with Mark and with all of those who are working to end this evil. We pray all these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.